Hi everyone, this is Mathieu Kadar, and I'm the ghost face in the opening scene in Scream 6. And yes, I'm the one who kills Samara Weaving. And you're watching Craven Something Scary. Well, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to Craven Something Scary, where it's all horror all the time. Well, tonight, guys, it is a very, very special stream, one that we've been looking forward to for uh, quite some time, and I know you guys have as well. We are going to be speaking with a great actor, and he's even more than that. He's a lot more than that. He's a filmmaker producer, director, uh, writer. He can do pretty much everything. So we're going to have a great time uh, tonight with uh, Bradley Stryker. Now, before we get started, I just want to let you all know uh, is the general rule. You guys know this. We've done this a lot together. And submit your questions, right? We'll definitely submit your questions in for Bradley, and I will be putting those up throughout the stream. He's been very generous tonight to uh, share an hour with us of his time. So we're going to definitely be respectful of the clock. So uh, we're going to do that. But in the meantime, send in your questions. We'll get to as many as possible. But I know you all understand that there's no way to get to everyone's question just because of time. And I have questions, too. So, <laughs> you know what I mean? So. We're not going to be able to get to everybody. We we do know that. But I promise you this. If you send in a super chat question or comment that you really want Bradley to, to address and see, you can absolutely do that. And I promise you we will not end the stream unless or until we've covered the, the super chat questions. All right. They move to the front of the line. I bump you right up to the front. And that's my promise to you as a way of showing thanks and appreciation for supporting the channel. All right. So we're going to get done doing that right now. Also, real quickly, I want to thank my moderators tonight. Several mods in the chat. I know Val is here. Uh, we've got other folks. Uh, Sarah's here. And uh, Julie's here. I, I could keep going on. I think Denisha's roaming around here as well. So just want to thank all my moderators up front and give you some recognition for the great work you do and keeping all of these live chats, the, you know, the environment that I wish it to be. And you do so, so well with that, where it's friendly, respectful, and we have fun. That's what this is about. It's about having fun, guys, while we're here. All right. So having said all of that, I'm going to go ahead because of time. I don't want, I don't want, you know, I want to maximize our time. So I'm going to go ahead and bring on here in just a second our amazing guest tonight. Now, he has done an, some extensive amount of work. And whether you're a, a TV watcher, a film watcher, um, heck, man, if you play Red Dead Redemption, I mean, you, he literally is everywhere. You've probably seen him. And in fact, I even saw he's uh, having, well, I watched the first episode last week of Tracker, the new, the new, uh, the new, I think it's CBS show and i saw that he's in an episode of tracker and so i am so ready i mean he's just so cool so you never know where you're going to see him at uh, but if you like you know the oc fbi law and order special victims unit um there's so many all altered carbon altered carbon was a great show uh arrow van helsing uh, he's even done like the Haley Dean mysteries. He did a couple episodes of, of that, which is really cool. I like those. I mean, I could the, the list goes on and on. But we're going to talk about his film that he was in that I thoroughly, thoroughly enjoyed. I've seen it multiple times. Dangerous Game, The Legacy Murders. In fact, I did a watch party on this channel. Was that a week, two weeks ago? I think it was that we all got together and watched it. Great, great movie. So without further ado, Please welcome my guest, Bradley Stryker, to the stream. Hi, Bradley. How you doing, Bob? 
doing great other than a little cough I'm fighting here. So okay. if, I have, if I have to mute myself out, just bear just, with me, man. <laughs> yeah, 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 I got it. No problem. <laughs> oh, man. But listen, I, you know, it's, it's, it is an honor to have you here. I really appreciate it. And let me just say this. I am so happy I'm talking to Bradley and not Burnham tonight. That's all I can tell you right now, <laughs> Woo, brother. If you if if you if Burnham showed up to this interview, I would be really scared. So um, I, I actually really like Burnham. <laughs> I think yeah. you, uh, he's, he's a very charming man. Um, <laughs> it's actually it was actually quite funny when I originally read the script and when Stephen and Scott came to me with the project because I was like. You want me to play what? The butler? And I was like, I, I played a lot of things. I had not played this part before. Um, but quickly of course, came to understand what it was what it was all about. Um, uh, what it was supposed to be. And, and it had a had a, uh, a lot of fun doing it, actually. Yeah. In the oh, end. man. Well, you, you, were, you were outstanding uh, in your role. And let me just say, like, and I'm not going to give anything away. I know it's been out for a while, but I still, I still want to avoid you know, key spoilers, we can, you know, if we can, but <clears throat> like I said, I did a watch party a week and a half ago. So we have freedom here. You have total freedom, but I remember the scene and, and I'm getting, I'm jumping way ahead because, but that's okay. We're going to get into it a lot more, but I'll say this real fit real fast. I remember the scene where they're looking for you and then they're, they're in like the tunnels yep. for lack of a better word. Right. And, uh, and I remember the scene where you walk up, like you you show up, and I'm like, oh, okay, here we go. We're gonna get some answers. And whoa, whoa, yeah, and then it, then it's like, shh, like, oh <laughs> my gosh, you know what I'm talking about. I and did. so, dude, just just a, a very very awesome character. Well, Tim I can actually back this up a little bit because. When I when I was offered the part and I looked into it a little bit and was like, well, who is this guy? How do they operate? There's actually very sort of strict rules that like a traditional, very um, uh, what's the, I forget the term I'm looking for, but sort of like a high end sort of butler. There's rules that they have to play by, even the way they stand and the way they hold their hands. Oh. They tuck their hands back like this so that they're basically in waiting. Um, there's all these very specific things, so it was, it was quite interesting because. The contrast of who he actually is in the movie versus all of the rules you have to play by if you are a butler for a very wealthy man were completely in contrast and they completely juxtaposed each other. So I think that's part of what was a little bit intriguing about him was what he was actually doing versus the way he presented himself when with John Voight's character. Um, wow. Uh, wow. These are nothing alike. Well, they're, I mean, they're actually a lot alike because he's doing, you know, he's following all the instructions and doing everything he's been told to do. But one of them is very active and the other one's very static. Um, oh, yeah. Cool. One of those two things to be quite different and interesting. That uh, is. Wow. You know, I'm kind of putting the whole thing together in my head. Oh, I love that, man. I love that dualism. Uh, yeah. That's really cool. No, that's awesome. And the fact that, you, you know, you did quote your homework, you know, you read, you dug into the role, like this character that's awesome, man. I think I think though, in general, I mean, as this conversation unfolds, you'll learn a lot more about that. But I'm, I'm a yeah. bit of a I'm a I'm a bit of a nerd, um, okay. <laughs> an acting nerd. But I, I've been through my whole life, right? Like when I grew up, I was a very serious basketball player, and I I was a basketball nerd. Um, okay. I was really into the technical part of it and like how things worked and how certain moves worked, and so I'd work on my spin move for hours, or just like anyway, just there's just there's just like the technical aspects, the homework part of it. Yeah. Growing up, I learned, I did that. But then of course, now that I'm an adult and I do this for a living, it's like whenever I play any part, I really dig into like a lot of the acting nerd stuff. Like, uh, and I, I find it quite intriguing. It also gives me something to do. Otherwise, you know, when you've been doing this as long as I have for 25 years now, the certain parts of it just become like um, the people brushing their teeth. You're just doing the thing you do. It's like you don't consciously do that anymore. But the, so when I'm doing my homework, I have to consciously discover each character before I can let it become a subconscious thing. Um, wow. Yeah. I love that process. And so Burnham was very particular, um, a very unique character for me to um, 
dive into because I've never, I didn't grow up in that world. I don't know anything about these people. So yeah, uh, it was very foreign to me and I had a lot of fun with that. Oh, that's, that's wonderful. And, and you, and we are going to talk a lot more about the movie and I'm so happy it, we're already peeling back the onion lever layers here a little bit. That's awesome, man. Uh, I enjoy it. <clears throat> it's a great story. It's a great movie, great execution, great cast. We'll get into all that in a second. Great location too. Of course, I'm going to ask you some questions about that as well. But uh, before we do, before we go any further on Dangerous Game, you know, you again, as I mentioned earlier, you've done uh, so much great television work as well as film work. And I would just like to know, take us back, as you mentioned ago, you've been doing it a while now. So could you take us back to that point where it became a passion, like we're acting and filmmaking even, uh, or, or maybe separately, when those became that passion in your life that you knew that was what you wanted to do? Interestingly, I mean, I mean, my path to being in front of a camera is actually quite funny because I didn't, I was an exercise and nutrition major in college. I didn't really want to go to college and I was paying for it myself. So I started at Washington State University and graduated from San Diego State University. And in the middle of all that, I ended up attending six different schools. So and I eventually graduated, of course, from San Diego State, but um, it, with a degree in kinesiology, exercise, and nutrition. Okay. Um, but in between my junior and senior years, I was in New York for a summer. I had been invited out there to do this, you know, sort of mo print modeling sort of stuff, which I didn't care for too much. Um, but I went out there and did that, and then I took a couple acting classes, and I was like, this acting thing is interesting. And then subsequently ended up back at San Diego State to finish school and ended up in a drama 101 class because I had needed to fill that credit still. And I remember specifically being in that class and then it being like um, the final of the class, which was a monologue in front of the class. Then when I was doing it, I didn't really know what I was doing, but it somehow grabbed a hold of me. And then all of a sudden I'm standing in front of my class doing this monologue and it grabbed a hold of me and I, was, I have this emotional reaction to it and connected to my audience, my classmates in a very different way than I've ever really connected to anybody else as an adult. And the high I got from it, but also just sort of the catharsis of like whatever happened in that moment was something that I was like, that's something for me. So wow. that was my last semester of senior year. And the day I graduated college in San Diego, I packed up my Nissan Maxima and drove to Los Angeles. And wow. the rest is literally history. And that was 25 years ago. Oh man, yeah, yeah, uh, so, yeah. So you went the traditional quote, if there really, not that there really is a not traditional path, really, but going. I'm going to go to LA, put my boots, my bootstraps, going to LA. I'm going to wait tables. I'm going to do whatever I need to do, yep. and yep. just you know, audition for everything I can audition for. Was that kind of the the path? Absolutely, got my completely. I don't know about language here, but I got my ass kicked. Um, Okay. Got tore up. I, I was a personal trainer, um, but I did have a. I did have a. Um, when I was at San Diego, I had a. I had a print agent who introduced us to an agency that did commercials and TV and film in LA, okay. and they signed me for commercials. And so, during my senior year, I would drive from San Diego to Los Angeles for a commercial audition and back. And I remember wow. sometimes my round trip was like seven hours. Oh. And for one commercial audition, which to me now is insane. But so then when I actually moved to LA originally, I was there at the very end of the heyday of commercials. Okay. And I auditioned so much. Mm -hmm. And I mean, I mean, I'm literally talking about, I think I probably had 100, 150 auditions before I got my first one. When I got my first one, I started making a lot of money. And three years later, I bought my first house. It was wow. crazy. Because the process of moving to LA, being a personal trainer, auditioning like nonstop, one of the things I identified really quick in LA was, oh, um, LA is full of gorgeous people. <laughs> it was actually a book. If you've ever heard of the, if you ever heard of a book, A Million Little Pieces, the, the guy that wrote that, James Fry, 
wrote a second book called My Best Friend Leonard. And in, in that book, he talks about moving from Chicago to L.A. after he'd sold. His book was on the Oprah Book Club, all this. But he described L.A. in the funniest way. He goes, L.A. is the craziest city on planet Earth. The three best-looking people from every high school in America moved here. <laughs> it was a fact, right? But so one, yeah. of the, one of the things I realized as a young person, I was like, I'm not going to win that contest. So I was like, the only way I'm going to survive here is if I'm better than it people or if I'm if I pick up the craft of acting so my first nine months in LA I took five acting classes a week and I I think I accumulated like 16 or 17 thousand dollars in credit card debt and then when I started doing getting paid to do commercials I paid it off real quick nice and uh, bought a house and all these other things but like so as I was actually learning to be an actor I was doing a lot of commercials for about a decade so I was very lucky. I don't know how young actors survive anymore because yeah. that, that doesn't exist anymore. And I, it's actually, it's actually kind of sad if I really break it down. Cause a person like me that doesn't come from a family with money, I don't know if I could, mm. I don't know. I don't know how well you could still do what I did because like, you know, my friends that were working in restaurants and all that, um, mm -hmm. they couldn't attend five classes a night no. or a week like I did. Cause I was class where they were working and then wow. I would, trainer all day it's just a different profession now but um so i got lucky that was that was sort of my my 20s and oh my god the business has changed so much it's insane but uh i drove from the literally a decade my entire 20s i spent driving around los angeles going from audition to audition mm -hmm. um, working and making a nice living but also uh quickly figuring out that there was the quality of life was not there so. oh i bet yeah that's that's that is gr you're grinding, man. You were you know you were grinding this this way, and and but you know what you 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 made it, man. You made it your success by that grind and that work ethic that you're talking about, you know. And I mean, I mean, obviously, it was it paid off. It paid off for you, and it's it's a it's a real testament to your work. Well, ethic. Thank you, and it's also just sort of it's just it's sort of my belief system though too, right? So. Mm -hmm. I think the world is a, is a pretty funny place because we, it's like, first of all, being a human being is not easy. It doesn't matter rich, poor, upside down, inside out. It's a, it's a tough slog and some people slogs harder than others, obviously. And, uh, right. But one of the things that's just sort of a, a fact is that no matter what your circumstances might happen to be, mm -hmm. if you're willing to put in whatever it takes to either attain, um, circumvent, uh, whatever it is you want to change or you want to go for, all these other things, if you're willing to put in the time and energy and the focus, kind of anything's possible, you know. And uh, I'm certainly not anybody who's got to sit back and just watch things happen for me. Um, it's just that I don't think I could have even if it was going to be possible. But uh, yeah, I what ends up happening with me is that because of the way I'm wired – that I like to do the work. If I don't actually enjoy it, I'll find something different to do. Uh, you know what I mean? If I didn't like being an actor, I'd be like, well, this is not for me. And then I'd go figure out something else I want to do with my life. Um, but, you know, sort of, there was a period when I was just an actor through my 20s, and then I discovered that wasn't quite enough. And then when I was about, when I was 31, I started writing and, direct, and then subsequently directing. And the three-headed monster of acting, writing, and directing, and well, also producing, really, but uh, has been has made my life work. Without all three, it doesn't work because wow. I get it, there's just too much extra time, and there's too much, you know, one yeah. one thing will lull, the other one will pick up. Like we were on strike, I sold some screenplays. Oh, good. So it's just like it's a there's a without that balance, also my family wouldn't be okay, you know. Um, but I, you know, I, as my, as hard as acting might have been, writing has been even a crazier journey because, I mean, I've written, I think I've, I've, I've sold some screenplays now, but I think I had written 25 or 26 movies before I ever sold one. And then once wow. I told, then I started selling the backlog and then all the, you know, the case, then all of a sudden it's an interesting business. But that one was a little bit tougher for me than because I just didn't know how to get access to turning it into a viable sort of profession. Um, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. outside of just the process of doing. Um, but again, it's the same thing. I just sat down and started doing it a lot. So yeah. Ooh, that's incredible. Well, you know, it, that's amazing how it, during that strike period, 
because of your other talents and and your other works you've been doing, still helping yourself, your family meet ends meet and doing the things you need to do. That's awesome, man. I mean, that's not everyone can say that. Like they really, not, they really can't. And but that's, it's, that's it's amazing. Interesting though, too, because <laughs> um, the there's a oh God, so the way my brain is wired is they like. When I played sports, if I was, if you like, if you think about sports, forget about my brain. So if you think about uh, sports, let's just talk about basketball. I already talked about it. So if you think about like the Michael Jordans and Kobe Bryant's and LeBron James, if you do a little bit of studying of these sorts of humans, the only thing you learn is that they showed up first, and when everybody else went home, they were still practicing. Yep. So it's all you learn about any of these people, yep. right? That's and right. All the actors I really, really respect. Most of them come from the theater. Or they spend time in a theater. And, you know, I think it's funny when I hear sort of actors who are like, oh, I just don't understand why it's not working out for me and all this other thing I've been taking. I've been in a class for two years, like every Tuesday, you know, and I'm like, I have a chuckle because I'm like, you're doing that. And there's a guy in London. There's a guy in New York. There's people in Missouri that are doing eight shows a week after they did three months of rehearsals. Who wow. do you think is sharper? That's right. It's just like they're putting in the time. They're putting in. It, it's. A, I, I guess what I'm really saying is it's a. It's not that mystical. It's not that like. Ooh, it's magic. I'm like, it's not really magic. Just like put your nose, put get your hands dirty, do the deal. That's right. Get busy doing whatever it is, and I find that to be the case with. Um, you know, I, you'll see me. You'll see as I talk, I go off on tangents. But one of the things that I that I find interesting is the sort of the, sort of the victim complex. Cause I've, I've had it in my life. We all have at certain points, but one of the things that until you've traveled a little bit and been to a third world country, you don't realize that if you're born in the first world, mm -hmm. you've won the lottery in some sense. Very and true. If, if you yeah. embrace that as a reality, as opposed to, it's not fair that I wasn't born rich or that I grew up in this trailer or whatever it is that does suck. And it's not fair, but you did not grow up somewhere deep in Africa or in Northern Thailand where they have no running water and no electricity. Nope. And the idea of them graduating college would be the same thing as me becoming the president. That's right. So I've yeah. always thought how fortunate it is, you know, <clears throat> viewpoint came from traveling and seeing the world a bit, but how fortunate it is to be in my position. And then what I do with it is up to me. And I, for me, it's like, it would be a, uh, an insult on some level not to put in the work. And if I want to do it to see if it's actually possible to do it, I have access to doing, which is studying and doing all these things and, you know, actually sitting down and doing it because my life is a luxury. I know that I don't have to wake up and survive. So That's right. That's right. I'm embracing it and I'm, you know, trying to make myself worthy of being gifted that. Wow. What a perspective. That's wonderful, man. Something we can all, really ponder on and and it applies to it doesn't matter what our career is our vocations it applies to it applies to everybody that's, well, that's 150 percent. yeah i mean i chose what i chose but it's like i have some very successful friends in other completely different fields and that's right they sort of operate the same way uh which is I have this opportunity. What am I going to do with it? And you know what? Sometimes people don't really want to do that. They don't. They're, it's not about professional success. Sometimes it's the seven kids. Fantastic. Right. That's a lot of work. That's right. Yeah. Um, right. But I, I guess what I'm really kind of leaning into a little bit is it's like, you know, you get one chance to do whatever this is, this being alive and a human thing. Um, I, I'm just kind of embracing the things that are in front of me that I'm really excited and passionate about and yeah. try to make things happen with them and some of it works, some of it doesn't. And, you know, I think it's funny when you hear you talk, oh, things have been great and all this. And I'm like, yeah, I mean, my batting average, if you really break it down from all the, for all the credits you see on IMDb or the movies you see, I also am aware of the 1,500 <laughs> that aren't on there. <laughs> yeah, maybe more, you know. Right. Um, the, the, nobody, I don't know. I don't know if there's another profession where you'll see quite as much no as we see. Mm. Um, point. Yeah. Yeah. I, mean, yeah. And I, I thought being an actor was bad. And then I became a writer, and that became even more absurd. <laughs> <You know? laughs> it's like add more, add more pain. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Uh, yeah. 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 Well, Brad, we've got a, a uh, audience member here who's submitted a uh, 
Super chat question. So let me get that up for us because I do promise these move ahead uh, from uh, you know, in front of the line for the chat audience. And it's our good friend, Drew. Hey, what's up, Drew? Thanks for the $5, buddy. I appreciate your support. Bradley, what was it like acting with Ben McKenzie? I'm a big fan of the OC and always loved your strong performance as his brother, Trey. Any fun stories? Uh, you know, I met Ben. I met him when I went to my fitting in Malibu when they were shooting the pilot of the OC. The first I was in the pilot, I was in the not in the very beginning, first two days of shooting. So I met him um, sitting outside of his trailer, and he had just driven across the United States three three or six months before in an old beater car. Um, he was I think he was started somewhere in the south, and then he went to New York for a little bit. Bought a car, went to LA to see what he could make happen and book the OC <laughs> in his first six months. So we became, we ended off uh, really well. We hung out outside of work. And I got to see this sort of transition with him from being this, you know, kid that was an actor to basically after three episodes, a, a superstar. And then his career is obviously just taken off. He's a, he's just a really nice guy. I mean, I think, I think you, what you, um, people gravitate towards in all of his performances are like, they can relate to him. Like he's a relatable guy. Like I think that's who he is. He's just, I think he's from, maybe he's from Texas, but he's just a, he's a very sort of relatable dude. And I hadn't seen him. My God, it might even have been like, we worked together. We hung out a bit. His life went, my life went. And then I was in New York with my wife and son. He was my son is eight now. He was really little then. I think he was two. We were in Greenpoint, Brooklyn, when Ben was working on Gotham. We were in a restaurant. We walked out of the restaurant, and they were filming a scene from Gotham. And my son ran through the scene, huge scene, sons of lights, green screen, all this. We were in between takes, because otherwise we would have grabbed him because my wife and I are both in the business. But he was running through the scene. I'm like, peck it. And I went out there and I'm chasing him down. And then Ben's standing there. I go, hey, Ben, what's up? And he's like, striker, no way. <laughs> been like a decade, right? Um, yeah. we, had, we had a nice chat there. It was just quite quite funny. But it's just, he's just a he's a he's just from I don't I don't know him intimately anymore, but from from then and through that sort of that run in, he's just a very authentic guy. He's a really nice guy. I think I don't think fans would be um, taken aback if they met him, being like, "Oh my God, this is an awful person." I think it'd be the opposite. They'd be like, "Wow, he's such a nice guy, so relatable." Um, mm -hmm. That would be the way that I would paint his picture. And he's had he's had a really nice career, and he's uh, he's had a bit of a storybook career in terms of how Hollywood works. You know, one show to the other, and they all the shows work. But uh, yeah. He's also he's also a good guy, so maybe that's part of the reason it happened. You know, maybe that sort of karma does exist. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Um, all right. Well, Drew, thanks for the uh, the question and and uh, also for your super chat helping out the channel. That's much appreciated, buddy. And uh, Paula, I see your question. I'm going to hang on to that just for a second. And uh, that once we get into dangerous game, we'll uh, definitely talk about that now. Last thing before we get into Dangerous Game more, I wanted to ask you about was Strike Force Films. And I know you've got some shorts that you've that you've produced there and acted in. So I would just kind of like to know if you could let us know because I because my moderators are putting up the link uh, for the website here so everyone can check it out. And what you know, kind of and I think I have an idea from what you already shared with your passion for writing and and, and filmmaking as well as acting, but what is your vision for Strike Force? Like, what's the short-term, long-term vision you have for your your film company? Well, so first of all, Strike Force Films started um, shoot uh, ten or fifteen years ago. But okay. Strike Force Films originally, I started writing, mm -hmm. and then I was like, okay, I started to find out how hard it is to get a feature film made, mm -hmm. and so I was like. I'm not going to pay for it on my own to make them make these, but I will pay to make some short films. Okay. So I simultaneously started writing short films and, you know, being, having been around actors for a long time. So one of the funny things about being an actor is I, 
I had a nice career. I made good money, bought a home, all these things. But I still didn't feel like I ever got a chance to show anybody what I could actually do. I remember one time I was sitting, I just worked on Stargate, and I was sitting with a group of actors. We're all having dinner, and Robert Carlyle's at the table there. And somebody said, one of these actors that likes to ask, ask these weird questions to a bunch of other actors, what's the thing you're the most proud of, which I found to be very odd, if I'm being honest. But then that's okay. Um, and so people were doing whatever and going around saying whatever, and I just remember sitting there and I'm like, well, it's easy. It's all the stuff I've done in class. And I'm sitting next to Robert, and Robert goes, exactly. Mm -hmm. And I was like, I, you know, I was like, it's interesting that he got that. But w one of the things was is that I realized, you know, when I, w I watch a movie, I'll, I'll watch a movie, a DiCaprio film, a Brad Pitt film, a Fassbender film, whatever it may be. It'd be like, oh, I'd love to play a role like that. Yeah, well, you know, the, the line in front of me behind Fassbender is pretty long. So what I was, what I said to myself is, if I ever want to play any of these roles, I might as well start writing it for myself. Dabble a little bit. So I remember I did my first one. I didn't direct my first one. I wrote it and acted in it. And instantly, after that movie was finished, a short film called A Weekend to Remember, the way people viewed me as an actor changed in one day. They watched it and they were like, oh, okay. You're not just the guy that plays the thug or does the thing or does that thing. Interesting. And so subsequently I kept writing and doing them. And what I ended up doing was being able to upgrade my agent that I had because I would put together at one point my entire demo reel was my own movies. And I sat with an agent who is still my agent today. And she's like, these performances are astonishing. And I'm like, yeah. And she goes, where, where are they from? I said, from my movies. And she just thought that was interesting. And I was like, well, one of the only reasons that I got to play those parts and play these characters is because I knew I could, I wanted to, and so I wrote them for myself. Mm -hmm. If I waited for, you know, um, Scorsese to call me to play the role, it wasn't going to happen. <laughs> and I find a lot of actors wait for the phone call. Yeah. So I was 32 at the time, and I had taken the power back, essentially, yeah? yeah. So first Films was born out of that, and then, of course, I moved up into features, um, made my first feature, I directed it, Wrote it, directed it, played a part in it, and we shot it in New York and Thailand, which was a phenomenal experience. And I think probably will go down as one of my favorite filmmaking experiences of my life. It was just, it was wow. astonishing what we did. It's astonishing, just nuts. Uh, <laughs> nice. So, and we did that. And so, the Strike Force films will now, as I, because I've just made a film called Sheltering Season, <clears throat> which doesn't quite fit the Strike Force films brand. So I have a new company called Everly Entertainment. We're building the website right now, and I believe online it'll be Everly, uh, in, uh, Everly Int, I believe, or something like that, .com, because Everly Entertainment's been bought. But um, Everly Entertainment will be my, my sort of bigger budget, higher brow um, right. production company. Strike Force Film will, will be my genre company. Yeah, yeah, okay. Uh, the vision for Strike Force Films is what it says on the website. It's live your life out loud. It's like, I it's, love that. it's about taking all of that creative stuff. It's essentially, I, I view it as a bit of um, uh, Pollock, just throwing paint, you know, that idea of the passion and the like, just like really kind of going for it, which would be Land of Smiles, my first film that I did in New York and Thailand. Mm -hmm. It would be right in vain with that, which is a we gorilla shot a feature film in a foreign country. And it was completely bonkers what we did. And wow. every time somebody asked us what we were doing, we just told them it was YouTube videos. Um, <laughs> okay. They didn't, they didn't see them thinking anything of it. They're like, sounds like you guys are having fun. Right. Uh, we, That's the thing we, we live in. <laughs> yeah, strategic about the cameras we used and all that. Right. Uh, but it's, it's kind of about that, the risk, being bold and just going for it. Whereas Sheltering Season is the last film we made that I was actually picked up by um, a company called Vertical Entertainment, which is a yeah. pretty higher end distributor, and they yeah. they ended up selling it to Tubi. So, oh, um, good it's job! A film, it's a film that is uh, it's a bit more of an adult movie. I don't know if that's the right way to put it, okay. but it's a bit more of a um, it's got more complexity to the characters. 
and it's a bit more drama than it is genre. It is a thriller. Okay. Uh, and th those would be the films that will live under there. Like, you know, a lot of the movies I'm moving into are just much bigger budgets and things. And so they belong in a more prestigious company. So I started Everly Entertainment for that reason. But I still do think, like, <clears throat> I love going out and going, you know what, let's just grab – Let's grab some. Let's grab low six figures. Let's get a bunch of people together. Let's go make a movie and have some fun. Let's get dirty. Let's just let's let's prove everybody wrong. There you and go. <laughs> that'll be that'll probably still be Strike Force films for me. Okay. Uh, some real genre fair too, right? Like fun stuff. Yes. Yes. Like I love Land of Smiles. It's it's far from a perfect movie, but I had so much fun making this movie. And what we did was absolutely insane. You know. It's a it's a horror thriller film just uh, tearing through Thailand with a killer clown in it. I mean, what else do you need? But, uh, it was just it was just it wasn't trying to uh, reinvent the wheel. It was trying to have a good time. Yeah, there you go. Yeah, and I really I think that's what that is for, right? Um, Absolutely. Yeah, that part of my life is very alive and well, and okay, really, I'm very very. Uh, I'm very passionate about that part of my life. I, like I'm a professional actor. That's how I make my living. And I supplement that by selling screenplays and directing movies and things like that. Um, and acting was, is something I love and it will always be there for me because yeah. I work at it, you know? Um, yeah. But this writing and directing thing is, uh, directing is so much fun because you have so much control. So you show up on set and <clears throat> there's no downtime. That's for me. Yeah, man. That's yeah. no, because you you're literally running the whole show, everything. Well, and I think it's hilarious because everybody's a writer because they can buy final draft. Good for you, everyone. Right, do it. Most people don't choose to educate themselves on how to do it, or they read half a book and they write something, and it's like good for who cares? Do it, do it. But the the one that kills me is that everybody is also a director nowadays. Because it is such a hard job to do well. And I'll work on professional projects that are falling apart. Mm. And the producers don't know what's going wrong, and they don't know what's going wrong, and they don't know what's going wrong. And I'm just sitting there, just yeah. and going, because the person that's running the show, the captain of our ship, has no fucking idea what they're doing. That it's just an interesting thing because they decided they were a director, but they didn't actually know what that even means. Yeah. Well, like, I'm such a nerd. When I watch movies, my wife drives her nuts. I have a notebook. Mm -hmm. I take notes. My notebook isn't in here. I'm taking notes on every movie I watch. Oh, my God, that's the opening. Wow, that's a great catalyst. Amazing. But that didn't work. Why didn't that work? Mm -hmm. So I have, I mean, I have 15 of these notebooks probably with <laughs> all these wow. movies. Thousands of movies in them that I'm like, oh my god! Wait. And every once in a while, I'll be like, what? Hold on! And I'll pause the movie and I'll be like, I should make that movie. And then I'll spend two hours writing the uh, brainstorm of something, you know. Um, yeah. And this was actually happened that way when I saw A Devil Inside, which was a cool movie, one of those found footage movies. But anyway, wow. it made, well, I could do that, and then I'll do that in Thailand. Well, you know. Um, this sort of thing, you know, that my brain does, but uh, yeah. <laughs> I really enjoy the the all encompassing everythingness of directing. And I don't. I'm 46 years old, and I mm -hmm. I don't think I think I'll when I'm done with whatever this being a life thing is. I don't think I'll have figured it out. <laughs> I think I'm going to be still figuring it out because it's like <laughs> I also feel that way about acting. I'm still going to be a figuring. That. That's why I love it because I go every Tuesday and I have my acting gym I go to. It's this with my classmates and we do the thing. We're grinding. We're all learning. We're all professional actors. People, have been, some of my actor friends, are like, why do you do? Why are you still doing that, dude? Don't you know what you're doing? And I'm like, oh, you don't understand how this works. <laughs> it's my gym. That's where I go and I get stronger and I pull things yeah. apart. And I go, well, how does this actually work? Because the minute you got it figured out, you need to do something else. Hey, like, that, there you go. Yeah, man, that's one. Wow, such wisdom tonight, guys, we're getting from, from Bradley. Great stuff to take to heart. And speaking of which, we've got also got another 
great question here that's come in. Hollywood guy is sending a five dollar super chat for the channel. Thank you, Hollywood guy. It says, "Hello, Mr. Bradley. Was there any uh, movie parts you wanted to play? Was there a movie you wanted to be in?" I mean, how uh, how long is that last? <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> and some of them are not even good movies. I just thought they were going to be amazing. Um, you know what's funny is is that there's a there's a lot of projects I've auditioned for that I wanted to be in, obviously, and then mm -hmm. the ones I remember, the ones that I always end up remembering are like, <clears throat> oh, that was interesting. I there was an audition for the the show The Bear, yeah, um, before the first season came out, mm -hmm. but it was for um, Jeremy's older brother that's played by John Barenthal, okay, and. I just directed my second feature in Louisiana and I got an audition for the part that John Barenthal plays, which is hilarious considering that John Barenthal is playing the part. They could have just given it to him and just left the rest of us alone. He's fabulous in it, but he did a great job. And I remember that audition because um, it was sort of a monologue audition. <clears throat> Another one I remember really well was Laura Linney's brother in Ozark. Cause the guy that ended up playing it, I believe his name's Tom. He was nominated for an Emmy for it did such an extraordinary job. And I actually knew him from New York. We weren't friends, but we knew of each other sort of thing. I was a moderator at a film festival that he had a film at that I was like, who is this guy? He's very good. He did such an extraordinarily good job that I was, that I remember watching it and going, A, jealous I didn't get to do it because it's such a great part, but B, he killed it. They hired the right guy. That I remember that more than I do the opposite, which is oh, they hired this guy and look at how awful this is. That's a dime a dozen. Yeah, it's also it's a Hollywood thing though too, right? Like I think it's interesting being an actor because people uh, when you're on an acting set, people all these sort of <laughs> these crew guys who are like you know men <laughs> and women, you know, they're like, they're moving stuff around and doing stuff. And my first job, I almost got fired because I went and took stuff off the truck. And they're like, what are you doing? And I was like, oh. hey, some stuff to the to set. And they're like, do you know, I'm like, I'm 23 years old. And like I'm in good shape. And they said, you know, they're like, no. And it's something, one of the guys walked me through it. He goes, you start doing that. You make our, our jobs pointless. So you need to stay in your life. So yep. it's, as actors have this sort of reputation for being these um, high maintenance sort of snobby sort of people that can't help with anything because you're not allowed to. Mm -hmm. Your job is, but also nobody really knows how we do what we do. Yeah, and it's looked at as this sort of foreign entity of like, whoa, this is so crazy and absurd, you know. Yeah, uh, I find it, I find it quite interesting because my mentality is more of a crew person, but I happen to be. <laughs> an actor who uh, yep. shows up and does the work uh, mm -hmm. and does, you know, sort of pulls apart that part of, of myself. But it's a very long answer for like the amount of movies that I've auditioned for and TV shows that I've auditioned for and wanted to be in is extraordinarily long after 25 years. Sure. Um, I think it's, I would focus more on the roles that I did get to play and the opportunities that I did get to have. And, uh, some of those, of course, paint my life in a much more positive way than thinking about the ones that I didn't get. Sure. So I think yeah. that's my, my answers would live more there. Absolutely. You know? no, like, there's wisdom in that as well. Um, Hollywood guy, thank you so much for your super chat and your questions for Bradley tonight. That's much appreciated. And also, Hollywood guy is celebrating a 10-month anniversary today of being a channel member here. Um, supporting the channel every single month. Thank you, Hollywood guy. You're two months away from the Gold Skull as a twelve as a one year channel member. Thank you so much for your faithful support. And he says, "Wow, um, it's good to be here." Well, it's good to have you, Hollywood guy. Thank you, buddy. All right, man. Time is flying by, guys. We're down to about fifteen minutes. I'll tell you what. Let's do this. How about We'll jump back into Dangerous Game, and I would like to – let's see here. I, went, I had a few questions I wanted to kind of chat with you about, and, and one of them was, 
when you got the a notification or whenever you were, were able to audition, let's say it that way, were you given a full script or a portion of the script or how did the audition work for that? For Dangerous Game? Yes, for Burnham, yes. So Dangerous Game is a bit of a different story. i done a film called Crawl Space with the producers of Dangerous Game. Crawl Space was with, um, uh, oh, my God, what's his name? Henry Thomas um, from E.T. Yeah. And uh, that movie I had done nine months or a year before, and the producers, I didn't actually audition for Burnham. They just oh, called okay. me if I wanted to do it. Beautiful. Yeah. Um, and I said, well, you know, let me read the script. They sent me the script, and I was like, this is insane. I was like, you want me to play? Butler, of course, as I told you. Right. But so in the movie, there's all of the the intercut, the voice, mm -hmm. the voiceover. Yes. That's all Burnham, right? So mm -hmm. um, it was very interesting because I was like, oh, this is an interesting part mm -hmm. because I am literally, my arc is completed through these sort of voiceover things. I'm like, I've never done this before. Absolutely, let's do it. And a chance to work with John Voigt. I mean, now I think I've worked with him on three movies, but um, yeah. I was like, absolutely. <clears throat> and it ended up being a wonderful experience. I got along great with John Voigt and Jonathan Rhys Myers. Um, yeah. I had known a couple of people there on the film. One of those, a couple of the cast on the film I already knew. Um, I just had a really, really fun time filming it. It was right around the holidays, like Christmas time. Okay. It was a, it was a, it was fun, and I I, uh, I got to know the director um, who I'd worked with before on an episode of Chesapeake Shores. <laughs> it's just a small <laughs> world, sort of like things connecting thing. Um, sure. so there, there was no real audition. It was more of a read the script, okay. ask some questions. Okay. This is what we do. This is when we're doing it. And me going, absolutely, let's do this. Let's jump off a cliff. This will be a blast. Yes. Oh. You know. and, and the movie is a blast. I mean, it honestly is, man. Um, yeah. And and again, like you mentioned, the the full cast could just get lots of accolades from me because it was wonderfully performed by so many. I mean, John, John, I mean, you know, John Voight. Come on, man, it's John Voight, right? I mean, yep. Yep. The guy's amazing. Um, and every, but again, every there were every every one, in my opinion, it was in that movie was cast correctly they it was just the right combination of people and uh and will it will sasso right yeah. um what a great job he plays as the brother uh the well the uh kyle's brother you know as and i one thing that jumped out to me um and i wanted to get your thoughts on this real quick uh, when you read the script but when i watched the movie Every time I watch the movie, this family, obviously, family is central, I mean, to this whole story. And there's so many layers that we learn about, that we kind of un reveal themselves as the movie goes. And Burnham is, is definitely family. Um, well, I'm just going to say this. The movie's about family. Uh, and I'll leave it there, okay? I don't want to spoil anything. For those who may not have seen it yet, but when you read the script, I know you were just kind of explaining how it was like, just how wild and everything was. But what did you feel about like this story, like this, this family trapped at the, you know, basically at this mansion, and, and you know, I mean, to me, like the locked-in location is my one of my favorite setups of all time. Well, I mean, and also the stakes are the think of the stakes, right? Like think of what mm. think of what needs to be completed by day's end. Um, and I think I love it. I think it's just it's fun because then you know you're talking about lightning in a bottle. I mean lightning in a house. It was right. it was quite fascinating and really fun. I mean, mm -hmm. without giving anything away, but with us knowing how the movie goes and ends. Yeah, I, I was at the end of it. I was like, I mean, I, I did not expect it to end the way it did. And then I was literally my next thought was like, well, I mean, where's the worst part two? Well. <laughs> Exactly, bro. And I, I was actually going to ask you that way when we at the very end, because the way it ends, that's all I'm going to say, the way it ends, it's definitely like, that's my question. 
where's the sequel? Like, where are we going to, where are we going? Because I've been told that there's, there's one being written. Really? See what happens. Oh, yep. That's exciting. Yeah. Yeah. That's very exciting. And, oh man, I got to say, I, I'm being careful here because I, I want to come right out and say what I want to say. But I let's just say. It's been really fascinating because I think that the, sort of the the main character of the sequel is a very interesting character and it'd be like where, where did this go uh, I, I mean i also just it, there's something about it the movie was received well and i think that so it'd be interesting to just see mm -hmm. what avenue what direction they want to the writer would want to take the the second one uh, me too and we know who the sir who survives the movie we do and yep. so that's, you know, let's just say I would be rooting for all survivors. Yeah. To return, you know what I'm saying? At the end. <laughs> yeah, buddy, let's go. Um, that's awesome. That's great to hear, though, that they actually are writing us. That's fantastic, man. Um, yeah, I mean, we'll see, you know, it's Hollywood, so. <laughs> oh, gosh, tell me about it, you know. I mean, I've got articles, literally, I looked up this week of a movie that was greenlit, allegedly greenlit in November of 2021 and thing is nothing's happened since then. So, I mean, anything can happen as you know, you know, it's just, it's the nature of it. Right. But we can hope we can cross our fingers. And uh, 100%. 100%. Yeah. now I, I have to ask you, Bradley, the location. Now I'm assuming a lot of this was in a stage, right? This was built sets. I'm assuming, uh, or was there a lot of real interior? The only thing that was really built sets were the like dungeony places. Okay, okay. The weirdest part was there's a very odd house mm -hmm. that a lot of the sort of living room interiors happened in. Oh, okay. people lived in that house, and I just remember right. being like, "What is this?" Yeah. There's also there's without giving too much away, there's the entrance of the house, which is yep. one house. Then there's the interior, which is another house. Because oh. the entrance house was too fancy. They didn't want us to be in it. Okay. That was an interesting shoot, too, where you have that long, the big front of the house. There was yeah. one... There was three days we shot the front of that house. Okay. Sunny one day. Rained nonstop another day. And then it snowed. Oh my gosh. Three days in a row. And it was all supposed to be within like 10 minutes. <laughs> oh no. Ha <laughs> ha. Well. <laughs> I just remember looking at the producer. What are you going to do? Are you going to spend a lot of money? <laughs> no, I can only imagine. Oh my gosh. Fix in post, baby. But yeah, no, it was interesting. It was uh, it was quite fun. But yeah, no, so it was, those were real locations, but the, the dungeon stuff was a stage, yeah. Sure. Makes sense. Uh, and the, you know the outside, the exterior, when the helicopter lands, you know, with Kyle lands on his helicopter and stuff, that's all a real location. All yeah. of that's real, 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 real place. And I don't think that's a mystery, but so the uh, it's all real houses. In wow! Yep! Wow! Amazing! Amazing! Uh, the house is amazing. Just it's as much character. Seriously, it's a character in the in the movie. Oh yeah! Oh yeah! For, for sure! Yeah! Yeah! Um, all right, so just a few little um, – well, hold on a second. I do have a question I've been hanging on to. Uh, and this kind of goes into the next section because I'd like to start to – we're going to just let everybody know. Guys, again, I said we, you know, we're always very respectful of our guest time. So we're going to – we're gonna we got about a five- to six-minute window. So if you have uh, – this is the last chance to get those questions in if you have them. And I have plenty, so don't worry. I've got – there's several here. But this is what I like to call kind of the, I don't know, not that that I hate to say the fun questions because they're all fun to me. They're, they're amazing. But yeah, I think you'll see what I mean. So Paula is going to start us off. She sent this earlier. It says, what's your favorite moment? Uh, we kind of already touched on John Void, but that's OK. You can, you can give more if you want. And what was John like on set? What's your favorite John moment? Is, John is the nicest guy. Just so oh. no. um, just really gentle and nice and like. I mean, honestly, he was he was giving me shit within five minutes. It was fantastic. You know, <laughs> That's great. Much fun. My favorite moment, moment said, sorry, because he's John Voight, but, you know, 
it, for some people, we all operate differently on set. But it was really funny because there was a younger actor who was just really excitable. And so he okay. went right up to John Voight and started asking him stories about deliverance in, in old movies. And I remember just being like, oh, man, this is happening. But then when he went on to answer the questions, we were all like, all right. Oh, yeah. <laughs> What's he gonna say? Yeah. So we, uh, he's very generous and he's not taken aback by any of that, you know. And he told awesome. he told a really cool story about um, Midnight Cowboy, just about how hard it was to get these movies made, and about how some of them came out of like they were in New York doing theater pieces, and they had this idea for the thing, and then all of a sudden they're like, we should turn this into a movie, and it was just it was a different time when art was a different thing. I mean, we have. We have so much focus now on like our phones and social media and yep. um, how much energy a person has in terms of followers and um, yeah, it gets away from like the, the sort of the craft and the the art of creation um, and the art of creation used to be just people that were doing plays together and they came up with ideas and then one of them did a movie called The Graduate and then he had enough power to get a movie called Midnight Cowboy done and. Two years before that moment, they were all just starving actors sharing an apartment. Wow. So we got to hear some of those really cool stories. Wow. Yeah, man. That's so cool. And and I don't know. I, I didn't look up because it doesn't matter to me. I, it really, that's why I don't, I don't look it up. But what his age is. But I can tell you this. He is not a, lost a step on his acting, bro. <laughs> They put him up and start doing the deal. Yeah, let's, yeah, let's go. He was ready to go, man. Like, dude. He, that's his attitude, though. I think he's going to be that way until he falls over, whatever that'll be, when he's 100. Because right. he, he's feisty, dude. He is a feisty guy. Oh, that's that's so cool, though, man. I love that. Um, so, I mean, I remember, well, I mean, I've seen him in so many things. My gosh. But I remember, like, one of the first times, I think I'm a little bit late to the game on John Voya because. The first thing I remember off memory is is Heat, when he had a little role in Heat, sure. Pacino and De Niro, and, yeah, yeah. and I remember him talking about how he really wanted to be in that movie. He wanted to act with De Niro, you know, and and if you go back and watch Deliverance and Midnight Cowboy. You'll be like, oh. what? Oh, that of course, yes. You're, oh yeah. yeah, that's right. Yeah. yeah. Oh man. All right, so a couple more real quick, and then we're going to wrap up uh, for the evening. Uh, did you? Um, what would you say was the most difficult or challenging part for you and your character, perhaps, or well, you, honestly, in making the movie? Like, was there a particular scene that was difficult to shoot, or was anything in general that you felt was challenging, especially challenging? But it's my answer is going to be a really nerdy sort of uh, act. The most challenging part of Burnham was his stillness, mm. because I have a propensity to move a lot, Bradley. Mm -hmm. And Burnham is very static. Very. And so the other thing that I found interesting is where he places his attention tells a lot. If you watch a scene with Burnham in it. Sort of in just a wide, which you'll never do because it doesn't exist in, for the public, but you'd get to see the way he consumes the room telling actually a different story than the one that's actually being told because everything I'm doing is for the best, for what's best for John's character. Yes. It's all pre-plotted, manipulative, and all these other things. Right. But it was very... Is very interesting being that still and also just where I placed my attention. It's a different sort of challenge. And some characters are very boom, boom. Those are a bit easier for me because it's more who I am. But uh, his stillness was a challenge for me, for sure. Wow. Wow. So was it really consciously like something you had to focus on? Absolutely. Because you, yeah. you, there's also these places where the script center where I would just kind of drift out of a scene and then come back with a piece of important information. Like I carried the game in at one point yep. and how you plan all that out so that it doesn't feel like just an actor doing what's needed for the scene. Yeah. That it's all that me listening to the conversation, this person says something and then I got to go do the thing to bring it back in. So that when we get to that part of the conversation, I can keep them wondering and keep it moving in the direction I needed to go in. 
Yeah. Uh, for lack of a grosser word for actors, but like the motivation of the movements for of even just where I place my attention is very important. Yeah. Yeah, for so, sure. That part's it's easier with certain characters, harder with others. So this one was definitely a challenge for that kind of stuff. Wow. Well, you, you did an amazing job. And I remember, and again, I got to be careful here, <laughs> yeah. but uh, there's a particular sequence where, uh, and of course, and I think it's, I think everyone knows that Burnham is an antagonist. I think we can, I think that we can safely say that um, again, we did a watch party on my channel of the movie like two weeks ago. So a lot of folks here, we all watched it together. They watched it with me. So what we can say that, all right, we'll just leave it at that. But there's, there's, yeah, there's, there's a lot more to the movie than that. Okay. I'm going to tell you that right now. hundred percent. hundred percent. But I will never forget the sequence where a, a particular group of people were uh, making, making a run for it outside. And, and I remember Burnham sitting up there with the car and like pops the trunk, I believe was the trunk. And I'm like, he is not, he is not doing that. And he has not got that in his hands. Yeah. And I'm like, no. Yeah. And like, of course, yeah. you know, you, you, yeah, not everybody's at a hundred percent health level, which we know. And, so uh, much fun though. That was oh, so much fun. It, was, it was great. No, it was awesome, man. You, yeah. yeah. You just did. It. I just want to compliment you on an amazing job of acting in that role. You you killed it literally, and I I I, I was so impressed by you in the movie. And when I when I saw it the first time back, you know, whenever it was last summer when it hit Prime as a new release, and I'm like, well, this sounds really interesting. And I I immediately rented the movie. The minute I got done. I'm seriously, maybe within 30 minutes of ending the movie, it was like midnight, I was writing you an email or a message. Oh, because I see, I'm, I'm serious, man. I, I said, I want, I want him. I want to meet him. I want to talk to him because the way you executed the delivery of Burnham was, was cold, calculated, crisp, and intentful. And, and I felt, I felt it like it just, I connected with your performance. Fantastic. And, I appreciate that very much. Thank you. Hey, you're welcome. Uh, it's from my heart. I, I really mean that. And so I'm just excited for what the future continues to bring for you and tracker. You're on tracker, man. You, yeah. You're on an episode of tracker, right? Yeah. Next, this Sunday. Next Sunday. This Sunday. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I can't wait because I watched the pilot hoping it was that you were on that episode. It was really good, though. I enjoyed the show. But I'm like, oh, my gosh. And I was telling all my friends, I'm like, hey, Bradley's going to be on Tracker. He's, he's going to be on Tracker. So I'm excited to see you. Well, it's funny because in, in the U.S., the Super Bowl ads for Tracker were like four times, I think. Yeah. But for some reason, in every one of them, I'm. Yes, you are. One thing. But it was so interesting because. <laughs> It's one episode of a TV show, which I've done, I don't know how many times now, 40 of times. Course. But what's so interesting is that uh, everybody's like, whoa. And, and people are like, dude, I can't believe friends from high school I haven't talked to in 15 years or something are like, dude. And I'm like. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. Oh, what a business. What a business. I'm like, dude, they can't believe this is happening. And I'm like, guys, I've been doing this for 25 years. Exactly. This is old hat. <laughs> this is old hat for me at this point. I mean. No, no. But it's the first time some of them see it because they don't watch any of the shows I'm on. So. That's so cool. But you know what? It's funny because when they were showing the commercial, I was watching it and I saw that shot with you. And I'm like, whoa, 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 whoa. Hold on a minute. And I, I, I got to back this up. And I backed it up. I said. I think that's Bradley Stryker. And I backed it up. I'm like, it is. Of course, then I go to IMDb immediately. And there it is. I'm like, oh, yeah, my yeah. gosh. So, anyway, I can't wait to see the episode coming up uh, this week. Yeah. That's it, should be fun. it should be fun. Justin's a good guy. I hope the show works out for him. Me, too. No, me, yeah. too. Uh, hey, real quick, guys, before we say good night, I want to acknowledge uh, my good friend Eric. The Beard Entertainment has gifted a channel membership tonight on the stream. Thank you so much, Eric. That brings a new person into the inner circle here of the cult of craven and i appreciate that eric's very kind of you 
uh, and welcome to the team, guys. Uh, thank you so much, Eric. I'm unable to pull up right now to see who got that membership, but I want to congratulate you and thank you and welcome, and I hope you enjoy it. Thanks, Eric, for your support, my friend. Well, guys, listen, I'm uh, we're going to go ahead and wrap up now with the great Bradley Striker. I know you guys have had an amazing time. I know I have. And there's so much to really digest from this. And you guys, listen, um, you know, you can absolutely go back and watch the replay. And, of course, I know a lot of you will be watching this on a replay tomorrow, the rest of the week, next week, next month, whatever that's out there forever. So whenever you're watching this, I want to say thank you for doing so. But great wisdom, Bradley. Thank you for sharing so much knowledge uh and wisdom from your perspective it was really it was really eye-opening man i appreciate that lots to think about for us of course it's my pleasure man thanks for having me oh it's absolutely in fact you can if you don't mind hang in tight yep. back i can meet you backstage like we did when we started sure and for everyone else though i will say uh we'll say a hearty good night i just want to remind you all as well before you leave that this wednesday uh, in two days, 21st, I'm hosting a watch party of Wes Craven's Scream. And my special guest will be Nate Reagan, who was a consultant on Scream 4 and Scream 5. We're going to be watching every Scream film for the next six weeks, starting Wednesday night, 1 through 6. So please come back, guys. Let's watch Scream together with Nate Reagan. He's going to give us some amazing insight as he has the, the basically the foremost screen used memorabilia from the screen franchise in the world. Unbelievable. Mm -hmm. So anyway, that's coming up Wednesday, but let's all give a round of applause and thank our guest, Bradley striker tonight. Wonderful job, my friend, wonderful TV shows, wonderful films, wonderful work. And I, uh, let me just say this. I'm going to be watching close for a sequel. That's all I'm going to say about, there you go. about yeah. that. Yeah, I'll be there. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds good. All right, everyone. Have a wonderful night. Thank you for all hanging out late with us tonight for a great interview and a discussion. And I will see all of you Wednesday night, if not sooner. All right. And Bradley, I'll see you shortly. Okay. Absolutely. All right. Good night, everyone. Thank you. <laughs> good night, guys. <laughs>